Welcome to Gotta Run With Will. My name is Michael Anderson, and I am your host for today's segment. Joining me today is Hannah Gavios. Hannah, welcome. Thank you, Mike. So Hannah, let's talk about your history a little bit. Hannah is a two-time New York City marathoner. She's a graphic artist, a yoga instructor, and recently named the New York Roadrunners Achilles Athlete of the Year. And I also want to mention, for those of you that were watching the big game, the Super Bowl between the 49ers and the Chiefs, Hannah was featured in a commercial for Budweiser. They call us typical Americans. Maybe because we live typical American lives. Like this typical American, showing off his strength. So typical. Always so competitive. Let's start with that, Hannah. What was it like to be in a Super Bowl commercial? Well, it was pretty exciting just watching the game and you know knowing that millions of people, if not billions of people, were watching this game and then seeing my face on television was pretty exhilarating. And it was just such a huge honor to be on the same platform as other American heroes in this country. There was a guy with the Free Hugs movement. Um, there was another guy that pushed a vehicle out of the snow. Um, there were two women from the soccer team. So just to kind of share that glory with them and, you know, be a great like representation and model for what a typical American is was just truly amazing and such an honor. That's awesome. Probably something you never imagined when you were a kid growing up that you were going to someday be featured in a Super Bowl commercial. I had no idea it was going to happen, but... <laughs> wow. Okay, so before we get to the combination of things that led to you being featured uh, in a Super Bowl commercial seen by billions, let's learn a little bit about you and your history. Um, so tell us a little bit about yourself. You grew up in New York, in Queens, yes? In Bayside, Queens. Bayside, Queens, New York. Mm -hmm. And you went to LaGuardia High School, which is just five blocks from this studio? Yes, actually. I went to school for painting, drawing, visual arts, and I commuted by subway and train every single morning and was surrounded by very ambitious and talented and creative, hardworking people that just really um, motivated me to push myself further and further. And a lot of people know that as the fame school, yes. I guess. always been an artistic person. It's always been part of your history. Absolutely. I inherit it from my mother. She's a painter. Um, she takes photographs all over the city and she likes to do people. And so she also does a lot of buildings and when she travels to countries like Scotland, she also paints a lot of the scenes there. I also get it from my sister as well. That's so cool. So we're just so a creative family. You're from a creative family. Yeah. I, I love it. And when you were at LaGuardia, you were on the high school track and cross country team. Yes. Tell, tell me a little bit about that. Yeah. So I always knew that I was a pretty fast runner and I loved running. I loved the adrenaline that I got from it. I mean, even just running to catch the train or the bus <laughs> sort of made me realize, like, how come I'm not on the track team? I should, I should join the track team. I should be more athletic. I was uh, in cross country, indoor and outdoor, and I got to run with a lot of people that shared the time. I remember there was a girl named Talia and we were like the 250 twins. <laughs> <laughs> so it was pretty incredible. And you know, after I graduated, I continued running everywhere I went, whether I traveled to Colombia or Thailand or, you know, just it was just such an amazing like way to see a new place. So it's fair to say that just running was just something that you loved and had a passion for as Absolutely. much as you did for the arts and, and, and cooking and other things that you I love. I love being out in nature. Yeah. Um, I get kind of bored when I'm just sitting like on the treadmill. Um, I feel like I'm not really going anywhere. So I like to you know go places and feel the wind and see my surroundings. So for those who don't know ab about your history, um, can you tell us uh, about how your life was changed in Thailand back right. in 2016? Yeah, so it's a pretty heavy story. I was teaching English in Southeast Asia and traveling throughout Thailand, Cambodia, Vietnam, ended wow. up working in Vietnam. And then I really missed Thailand. So I went back there for a short vacation and there was a local guide that offered to help me find my way back to my hotel. And he took me up a tall cliff and tried to rape me. Oh so as 
as a result, I ran away from him, pushed him away. It was very physical, the fight. Yeah. And I was able to get him off me, but then when I saw that he was following me, I started picking up speed and I ran and I fell off a cliff that was 150 feet. And I was at the bottom of the cliff and my attacker came down and spent the entire night with me. It was extremely scary and I laid there paralyzed, unable to move. I was very hopeless. Uh, there was no one there to save me. And so I had to save myself and I had to be my biggest advocate. And the only thing I could do in that moment was just remain calm. And it, it actually, um, you know, turned my attacker into my savior. And he actually rescued me and came back with people that brought over a harness and a stretcher and a bunch of men carried me down the mountain. And I went from one rescue boat to a clinic. And then ultimately I received emergency spinal surgery that night as my parents were flying in from the other side of the world. Oh my God. Yeah. Wow. So do you remember everything? from when you fell off the cliff. Yeah, through. I remember all the thoughts I had while I was in the air, like I'm only 23 years old, I thought I had so much more to live for, and then I thought about my family and all my friends, and I felt like such a bad person for being in this terrible situation, like putting my life at so much risk. I felt so guilty about that. But then I just committed to the idea that I wasn't going to live, and I accepted it. And so it was just a very, like, weird, like out of body experience. So you went but, from thinking there's no way I'm going to live, yeah. I've accepted this, to I, I'm alive and now I, I need to find that will to right. survive. I initially let go of that attachment to live. And then when I lived, I had to then reattach myself to life. Mm -hmm. So that's when you really started to show your true toughness and your true colors, I suppose. I was given no other choice. Yeah, that's right. You were given no other choice. It's, it's fight or flight, so to speak. Yes. So you endured um, hours and hours of surgery at that point. I think it was two hours. Okay. And then you were transported back to the United States? I was in Thailand for about 18 days okay. before being transported back to the United States. And you spent time at that point at Mount Sinai. At Mount Sinai yes. Hospital. I was an inpatient for two months. For two months, okay. Can you tell us a little bit about what those two months were like in, in Mount Sinai, just sort of relearning what your life was going to be like now? It was very difficult because I didn't enjoy living in a hospital. Nobody um, does. <laughs> and it was overwhelming because um, while I had so much love and support from so many people, and there were so many people that reached out and visited me and brought flowers and food and chocolates. It was great, but I didn't know how to deal with all of that. I felt like pressured to entertain people right. and reassure them that everything was okay, even though it wasn't, yeah. it wasn't okay. And so I had to go through my own grieving process. So with everything you're going through, you're, yeah. worried, you're worried about your friends and family members. You're worried that they're gonna be bored and you want them to be happy, is that? <laughs> I didn't feel like a normal Normal person. Yeah, Everyone okay. wanted to have a normal conversation with me, and I just couldn't. My head wasn't there. And I was very focused on just getting back on my feet and being as strong as I can. And I was, I received a lot of uncertainty from the doctors. Well, I would what, ask, what did they say? What did they say about your long term? Uh, just life. What, what did they say your life was going to be like? Would you be able to walk again, They for didn't example? really say anything. Wow. <laughs> I got very similar responses both in Thailand and in the U.S. Um, when I asked doctors in Thailand, will I ever feel my feet again? Which I thought was an insane question. Like, of course I'm going to feel my feet again. They mm -hmm. said, I don't know. Oh my God. And then when I asked, like, how long is this going to take for me to heal? They said, most of your recovery will happen in the first six months. And then after two years, not much recovery will happen. Um, so we can't really predict. And it takes, you know, about a centimeter a month for the spinal cord to heal. Um, so wow. at that moment, um, I had to do whatever I could in my own control, which is working with what I had and working with the muscles that weren't affected by this injury. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, you had some feeling in your feet and in your legs. I have a lot of feeling in my quad muscles Quads. and my knees work. 
Um, so it's really the backside and the feet and the ankle and the calves that aren't working. So I really had to like work on my upper body strength in order to walk with crutches or a walker. And I had to work on my abs and um, really just whatever I, whatever I had. <laughs> Any muscles in my legs that were working, I really needed to fire them. What was it like taking those first steps on your crutches? Scary. Yeah. I remember at the time my therapist was pregnant <sighs> and she was behind me in one of those rolling wheelchairs. Yeah. And and she was slowly feeling behind me in case I fell, and I totally fell on her pregnant belly. Oh. <laughs> her baby's fine. Baby's fine. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But it was pretty scary going from a walker to crutches because when you're holding crutches, like your entire life is in your hands. Yeah. Like you can't just lean everything into a walker. Like just imagine like a, a shopping cart at a grocery store yeah. where you have all this support. I mean, two crutches is not that much support no. um, for somebody that can't use much of her legs. Right. So it was terrifying. And I had to learn how to use, like walk with a proper gait. Uh, so I, I had a new therapist after my previous one went on maternity leave, and she taught me a technique of walking with um, opposite leg, opposite crutch. And so at first I used to do like right crutch, left leg, mm -hmm. right leg, left crutch, something like that. Mm -hmm. And it was very slow. It was like a four step process. Mm -hmm. And then over time, um, I practiced and practiced and practiced. And that four step process became a two step process where I simultaneously led with my leg and opposite crutch. Almost like coaching runners to have good form. You were yes. being coached and it became second nature at a right. certain point. Right, and we didn't focus on my speed. Um, it was more important to focus oh. on the form initially. Right. Right. You got out of the hospital. Um, you were um, obviously you had a long way to go for not only your mental, your physical, but also your mental recovery. Yes. And you had always been a runner. Uh, you ran the Brooklyn Half Marathon, nearly uh, nearly broke four hours. You you loved running, so yeah. it it must have just driven you absolutely crazy to to be out in your neighborhood seeing runners or watching yeah. runners run a race like the New York City Marathon. Can you tell us about? What went through your head? Even just seeing people walking down the streets. Like, I would sit in a cafe and look out the window, and I saw just people walking without crutches, without walkers, and I'm just like, oh my God, like, they make it look so easy. And here I am struggling to take a step. It was very overwhelming, but I had to stay present. I had to focus on all the small goals. All the things that helped you stay mentally strong through the whole ordeal you used to yeah. help you through that time as well. Right, because I realized that thinking very far ahead yeah. was very far-fetched and unrealistic, and it would only make me angrier. Um, so I had to you know, focus on what I had going for me on that day. And it's like, okay, what can I do to turn like walking for walking across the street in one minute to walking across the street in 30 seconds? How can I make the most out of what I have right now? Take like baby steps. Yeah. yeah. Tell me a little bit about this, if I have the story right. You were watching the New York City Marathon and wishing you could be there. Is that when you learned about Amanda Sullivan? How did you find out about Amanda? Oh, well, so my sister, she's a marathoner as well. Right, Rachel. Yeah, Rachel. And she was supposed to do the marathon say, the year I got hurt. Right. But instead, she opted out because it was just too much for her to handle what her sister's going through. Mm -hmm. and, and she decided to do it the following year. And so the year that, yeah, but the year that my sister was supposed to do the marathon, I was still hospitalized. Mm -hmm. It was in November and I was doing rehab outside the hospital. And I just remember hardly being able to make it across the street. Yeah. And I saw runners like so effortlessly taking these leaps, doing 26.2 miles like it was nothing. Yeah. And I felt so bitter because it's something I've always wanted to do and as an able-bodied and I felt like my dreams were crushed. Like, I'm never going to be the same again. You thought, I'm, ne I'm never going to be a runner. Yeah. I mean, I felt like a runner mentally mm -hmm. and spiritually. You wanted to be out there. Yeah. But, like, physically, I couldn't do it. 
So the following year, my sister ran the race, and she sent me a photo of Amanda and a few other amputees at the finish line, calling them the real heroes of the New York City Marathon. Yeah. And then I thought, like, wow, this is such a good idea. Crutching the New York City Marathon, I could do that. <laughs> so it gave you some hope. It did give me hope, seeing that it was possible for others and that there's so many ways that one completes a marathon um, just opened me up to more opportunities. When did you make that leap and decide, I am going to get on my crutches and do the 2018 New York City Marathon? So it was probably like the March after. March after, okay. Marathon, yeah. Um, I figured, you know what, like, I'm gonna do my comeback. <laughs> mm -hmm. What did your friends and family say when you told them you were gonna do Oh, this? they thought I was crazy. Okay. They didn't believe it. <laughs> they didn't believe it. They are like, there's absolutely no way you can do a marathon. Yeah. So. And, nobody, and no one was taking me seriously. Like, I would tell, like, my coworkers, my boss, like, oh, like, I, I trained this weekend. <laughs> like, I'm outside training. I'm, I'm going to do the marathon. They're just like, yeah, okay. <laughs> so what was your preparation like? So this was a, a whole new world for you. Yeah. You'd never run 26 miles, let alone done it on crutches. Right. How did you prepare yourself? Yeah, so I teamed up with Coach Mark from the Christopher and Dina Ree Foundation. Mark Zenobia. Yes, mm -hmm. and he was my virtual coach because he lives in North Carolina. Carolina, and mm -hmm. I live in New York City. Mm -hmm. So we were on the phone with each other for several months without actually meeting each other face to face uh -huh. until the weekend of the race. Wow. He really wanted me to focus on the time at first. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to see like how long I could really be out there for. And so once um, I showed him that I was able to you know, withstand three hours, that's when we began calculating the miles. I remember the first time that I calculated my miles and I did six, like I was done. Yeah, you were shot, <laughs> six miles. Yeah. Right. yeah, and it took me forever. And initially I thought I was gonna walk the marathon with the same gait that I learned in physical therapy, opposite mm -hmm. crutch, opposite step. Um, but then I figured like it took too long. Mm -hmm. um, and if I'm gonna do it this way, I'm gonna be out for like two days. So you learn what to propel so yourself I, forward. Yeah, so I learned how to swing with my crutches, um, which isn't walking, but it gives me the same adrenaline that I received as a runner before my injury. Mm -hmm. And you know, it makes my heart dance and it, it's such a big stress reliever. Mm -hmm. And I'm able to just like channel any negative energy and just sort of push it out. So it's just, very therapeutic and very healing and hard. But you started to feel like a runner again. Yeah, like I would sort of just start with the swinging and then when I get when I got tired, I would revert back to the walking. Right. So in my training initially, it was half swinging, half walking. Um, and I spoke to Coach Mark about this and we decided over time that we should try to make, um, for my goal to be that um, I would swing about 80, 90 percent of mm -hmm. the marathon. Okay. Yeah. Make, make from a coaching standpoint, that makes perfect sense. Right. But initially, he wanted me to walk it. Yeah. So we both um, went back and forth a lot. And, and I, over the course of many months, mm -hmm. I changed my mind several <laughs> times, depending on you know my experiences and yeah. trial and error. Right. Race day arrives. Walk us through that. Tell us what it was yeah. like that morning. Yeah, so I felt more confident because I had done almost 19 miles as my longest distance Which before the great. race. A lot of runners don't even get that to that point. Right, and yeah. they say like if you can do at least 18, you can do a marathon. Mm -hmm. um, I felt pretty confident. I knew it wasn't going to be easy, but um, you know, I just I didn't want to think too much about it. I thought like the yeah. more I would think think about it, the more anxious I would get. I became excited to do it. I was under the tents and I stretched out my legs and I drank Gatorade and ate bagels and coffee and. <laughs> what, was it, what was it like going over the Veranzano Bridge? It must have been just your heart must have been racing. Yeah, so it was pretty amazing because the initial plan was for me to do this race completely by by myself. Uh -huh. And then a few weeks before the race, um, we had planned for my dad to be my guide yes. for the second half of the race mm -hmm. um, so that I wouldn't be stranded out in the dark by myself. Mm -hmm. But then um, I actually bumped into Amanda at the starting point. I messaged her and told her that she inspired me to do the marathon and she was so happy. Yeah. And we began the race together and it's probably gonna take me like 
13 hours to do this. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to hold you back. I don't want to ruin your time. Like, go ahead. And she's like, no, I'm perfectly fine. Mm -hmm. So we stuck together from mile one to mile 26. And going over that Verrazano Bridge, it was great. Like, we both really got to know each other. Mm -hmm. And we got to exchange stories and on such an intimate, personal level. And we both felt a lot of the same emotions. I love it. It's amazing. And so much more, like, heartwarming. Yeah. I remember that day. Yeah. Uh, my wife and I were at mile 13. Approaching mile 13. <laughs> Looking good, ladies. All these people holding up signs that said, go Hannah, Team Reeve. We yeah. thought this person must be very popular. And, <laughs> and then, there you were. And I think the excitement of seeing your friends and your family, your supporters from Team Reef, you just started moving really quickly. And we were like, oh my God, she's crushing this race. She's amazing. Crushing and crutching. Crushing and crutching. It was, it was awesome. Um, we Thank were just you. so impressed. We were screaming for you. And um, it just really made our day. That's it so was, sweet. We, we had already had an amazing day cheering on everyone from Achilles at that point. And then we see you come through. And it was Day's just. never a, over. It was right. It was just incredible. Tell us what it was was like crossing that finish line that finish in, in line. darkness. Yeah. The last 10 miles of the race, it was pretty empty. Yeah. They started removing the barricades. They were opening up streets for cars. And there were no spectators outside. I don't expect anybody to be here. Like, I'll be lucky if there even is a finish line. Mm -hmm. um, maybe there's like one or two people to hold me a medal. <laughs> So I, I felt sad, you know, I'm just like, yeah. oh man, like everyone's done, it's just us, we're alone, but you know what, we're doing this for us. Yeah. Um, that's the most important thing. And so once I approached that finish line and I saw like almost a thousand people there, Yes. I cried because I didn't expect that to happen. It was like the best surprise party that you can ever get. Yes. It was just so beautiful, like seeing all these people waiting out in the freezing cold for us for all these hours with all these signs and the cheering. And it was like the best day of it's my life. One of the best. I will never forget that moment. What a great surprise. And yeah. That's one of the best things about the New York City Marathon. Peter Chacha and his team started this tradition years ago. What I like to say to people from Achilles who say, you know, I, I have a disability, I'm worried, that I'm going to finish in the darkness, I'm worried that no one's going to be there, and right. I just say to them, get ready, you're not going to be disappointed, it's going to be a party, it's going to celebrate you, and it's going to celebrate everybody else who's done the marathon, and you're going to love it. Um, and you just spoke to that firsthand. Yeah, um, and I think the marathon like really brings out the best in people. Yeah, and it's just incredible like how much there's how much support there is that day. You did it. You became a marathoner. You, yes. you accomplished your goal. But now that you're a veteran, what was how did it feel to to have that? sort of have that monkey up your back and, uh, uh, you know, chase after the New York City Marathon yeah. a second time. I felt so relieved <laughs> because yeah, I was struggling yeah. the last uh, last couple of miles. It was hard and I almost gave up on myself. Mm -hmm. It was it's the best day of my life, but it's also the worst day the of my day life. Too. Yeah. Um, it's like you really have to push yourself and it's torturous. So to finally be done with that is amazing. Like I appreciated my sleep so much that night. Oh, you um, slept just great. eating pasta and taking a nice bath. It just felt so good. And so I feel like, you know, you really like can't appreciate the good things in life without the bad things in life. I believe yeah. everything balances each other out. Yeah. People who have seen you out there crutching, people get so inspired. And I, I guess uh, what I want to ask you is, what message do you have for, for other people who are experiencing either, you know, a tough time, desperation, even hopelessness in their own lives as a result of a tragedy? You found that desire to overcome. What, what message would you give to others? Stay present. Stay present. Yeah, stay in the present moment. Um, don't let um, you know big ideas overwhelm you. Um, a lot of people are going to tell you that you can't do it. Um, a lot of people are going to put you down, but the most important thing is really believe in yourself. 
your thoughts create your reality. And so if you have any negative thoughts, you're just going to go down that rabbit hole. And so think positively and start yourself with more realistic goals, things that you believe that you could achieve. And then once you see that you could achieve those goals, then your world is your oyster. And there's so many more things you could achieve moving forward. But try to think realistically. I because if it. you don't believe you could do something, then you're not going to do it. So do what you, could, you believe you could do. That's a great message. Thank you. So What's next for you, both in your running, running life and in your professional career? So my professional career, I just started a new job at Ralph Lauren. Congratulations. Thank you so much. I'll be doing packaging and graphic design for them. Right in your wheelhouse. I'm going back to school right now for psychology. That's um, awesome. So one of my goals is to really like help people that have gone through traumatic experiences um, or people that have new injuries, mm -hmm. how to cope with those traumas. So take the lessons uh, you've learned for, for coping right. and recovery and, and help others. Right, and I wanna take a more humanistic approach to therapy by focusing more on the person's strengths than their weaknesses. Um, because I think like we all have strengths, but we don't always see them right away. And I think um, I didn't even know I was this strong. And my experience exposed my character more than it ever has in its entirety. Um, so I was able to find like my inner light and my strength that was always there, but I never really saw. And I believe everyone has that, but they're just not always aware of it. There was a strength that you didn't even know you had. Yeah, absolutely. That's awesome. Um, and also, I have the New York City half coming up, and uh, I'll also be doing the popular Brooklyn half. Both of those races, an incredible celebration of continuing yeah. you and your story of recovery. And then in November, I'll do my third New York City marathon. Let's get after it, Hannah. Yeah, never let's, stopping. Let's keep it up. I love this. I love it. <laughs> so I'll just say that we have loved having you join us at Achilles International after Aww. you did the New York City half last year. You got in touch with me, or I got in touch with you. I forget how it happens. Next thing you know it, you're joining us in Central Park and training with our chapter and some wonderful friendships and bonds have formed and Absolutely. we just love having you. It's just, it's great. It's I love great being part of this. I love your energy. I love the spirit. I just love all the positive energy. Um, thank you so much for encouraging me to move forward and really to help me push myself yes. too, because we all need that push. And we can't wait to see you at Hope and Possibility as well. Thank you. <laughs> can't wait to be there. Awesome. Thank you again, Hannah. I want to thank the Manhattan Neighborhood Network and Will Sanchez for hosting us today. This has been Gotta Run With Will.